straight to questions. Senator Williams. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, folks, for being here. Um, in relation to the business case for why the Inland Rail needs to acquire greenfield sites, particularly along the stretch between Narramine and Narrabri, why is that the case that it's got to have a greenfield site? Well, uh, the key, the key. Sorry, yeah, sorry, Mr. Fulton. Sorry. Just got to give you a name, rank, and serial oh, number. Yeah, John Fullerton, Chief Executive Officer, Australian Rail Track Corporation. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks, Mr. Fullerton. The uh, the 2015 program business case was quite specific in terms of the the requirements that Inland Rail needed to meet in relation to the market. Uh, around about. 70% of the revenues that are generated by Inland Rail will be intercapital freight from Melbourne yep. to Brisbane. And currently, um, on the east coast of Australia, we only have a market share of probably less than 25%. And that's because uh, it cannot compete with road. It's uh, a longer route. It's about eight or nine hours longer than uh, road. Therefore, you know, it was pretty important from an inland rail point of view that you build this track to be able to achieve a market share shift from road onto rail. Okay. And is, that, is that the reason you're not using more of the existing rail line, for example, a Canamble line? Well, I mean, for the Melbourne to Brisbane route, which is 1,700 kilometres, we're using about 60% of the existing rail corridor. But of course, uh, there are some greenfield sections around about 600 kilometres in total, uh, 300 odd kilometres in New South Wales, which is the narrow mine to narrow bry section, where we really had no alternative but to uh, build that as straight as we can, again, to achieve that service offering. And also in Queensland, uh, a large section between the border and Gowrie, again, with greenfields to achieve that service offering objective, which is less than 24 hour transit time. Okay, Mr. Fullerton, and we lived through this, through this on our farm in South Australia when the Indian Pacific Line was built. Went straight through our farm. Let's just go some questions farmers would be asking. You'll pay full price for the land you resume, no doubt? Yes, there is a process that we go through for to value the land. Okay. Who values the land? Uh, the landowner themselves can seek their own valuer and, uh, and we pay for that. And then okay. it's part of a negotiation with that landowner. What happens if the value says, well, it's $2,000 an acre and the landowner thinks it's $3,000 an acre? Who's going to uh, settle that dispute? Look, you know, we'd like to think that, you know, all those land acquisitions will be achieved uh, through negotiation. But there is, you know, there, are, there is mechanisms to, to deal with that if we can't reach agreement. But we expect and we hope that uh, all those land acquisitions can be resolved uh, between us and the landowner. OK. So you've got to come to agreement with the landowners? You cut a paddock, 80% of the paddock on one side, 20% on the other. There's no water in that 20% because the paddock's been cut. Do you pay for the infrastructure to put water into that 20% the leftover piece? Well, part of the valuation will look at how some parts of the land will be degraded for that reason. It can't be either usefully used as agricultural land. And we, there no, could no, be no, option. No, 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 let me yeah. paint that picture clearer. Yeah. <coughs> There's a thousand acres in a paddock. You cut off, you take your stretch of land for our line, you've left 100 acres in one corner, 850 the other corner. There's no water in the 100 acres. That's still a pretty handy piece of land if it's good soil, 100 acres. What happens with, with the water infrastructure if, they've, if they've, they've got to run the water infrastructure to the other side of the railway line? Well, they're, they're the, exactly the sort of thing that we can talk to individual landowners, how we, do, we can provide water if that land is retained for agricultural purposes, or we We'll look at how we could provide stock crossings, machinery. All those things will be taken into account when we look at that final corridor. Bearing in mind, we'll try and avoid where we can uh, severing paddocks, but eventually that will have to be the case. But you know, we want to make sure that the, the land that we take is kept to a minimum and what's left over for use by the farmer is, uh, is maintained in a viable way. Which well, on a greenfield site, severing paddocks would be part of the project. It would be, but I mean, on that, we, we tried to follow either property boundaries or fencing lines or uh, all those types of things to try and minimise it without compromising the need to make it as oh, flat and yeah, straight as we can. OK, bit. the fencing. Who fences it? In greenfields, uh, we'll pay for the capital cost of the fencing and the ongoing maintenance. And the ongoing yes. maintenance. Greenfields. That's greenfields. Something that's not a farm now. Is that right? 
Sorry. So you do the ongoing maintenance. So basically, it's greenfields. Something that's not you available. will do all of the negotiations with the landholder. What do you pay for the land? The landholder can get it valued. You'll pay for the valuation. You'll pay for the fencing. You'll pay for the outkeep of the fencing. You'll pay for the ward infrastructure and so on. Is that how I'm reading it? That's right. I mean, every case will have a different set of circumstances, but you know, our objective is to make sure that we have minimal impact on landowners along those greenfields corridors to keep as much of their land uh, available for their use. At the same time, you're going to have to have the line, the strategy can as well. You're not going to go bending around each property around their boundaries. No, we, can, we cannot. The train driver we, get giddy. No, we cannot zigzag. It needs to be flat and straight. That's right. So therefore, I think you're going to be cutting a lot of paddocks and a lot of properties. Mm -hmm. Going on what I've seen in South Australia when they built the Indian Pacific. Mm. I can't see any way out of that. The boundaries, you know, if you fluke to get alongside a boundary, that'd be just a fluke. 95% I think will be going through paddocks. And so the message out there to the farmers is negotiation, talk about the prices, the compensation, fencing, <laughs> water infrastructure, the number of crossings required on a property to get machinery and livestock across. All of that? All of those things will be taken into account with every individual landowner. And last question, if the farmer thinks they're hard done by, who do they go to appeal their argument if they can't come to an agreement with ARTC? Well, I mean, there are limit mechanisms. I mean, we, we don't think it will get to that stage. With, uh, uh, that's not the question, yeah. whether you think or not. You can bet there'll be some blues. There always there are. There'll be some blues, and the, and the landowner, if we can't negotiate with the landowner, they may choose not to uh, do the deal with us on a voluntary basis, but there are mechanisms under the New South Wales legislation that deals with these problems uh, when they occur. But we, we, but we do think we'll be able to negotiate satisfactory arrangements with every landowner. If you can't and it comes to a blue, then you're going to use a big fist, is that right? Well, they'll have mechanisms under the New South Wales Act legislation. Which would be the big fist. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Senator Williams. Oh, could you stick around? Because I've got some questions on this too. So yeah, go for it. one thing about Senator Williams and us, uh, we've worked on this in the best interest of Australia's food production industry, there's no doubt, so I might need your hand here.